term demon elicits all kinds of emotional, psychological, and spiritual responses. Often negative and sometimes terrifying. But what are demons really? Do demons exist in our minds? Or are they entities living in a different reality and at war with humanity? Join me for the next 50 minutes as I attempt to find out what exactly are demons. The Irish poet and statesman William Butler Yeats, the father of psychoanalysis Carl Jung, the painter Salvador Dali, and even the great Italian medieval poet, writer and philosopher Dante himself were all believers in demons. What makes these learned and scholarly men come to the realization that such things as demons were rooted in fact? The answer lies within coming to terms with the full understanding of what demons and demonic forces represent beyond superstition and religious phobias. On one level, demons are indeed a useful metaphor to explain the darker, unsettling mysteries of human consciousness. But on the other hand, it would be equally unwise to dismiss that demons are also very real non-human conscious entities and that such ideas are exclusively rooted in being merely products of human ignorance and superstition. To the religious person, demons are nothing less than the emissaries of the devil himself. Yet this is only part of the story, as belief in demons transcends religious devotion. In much of the Celtic world, and particularly within Irish folklore, the distinction between what is a demon and what are fairies, or the she as they are known, is hardly distinguishable, and has been so since pagan times. Outside the British Isles, the mysterious Donos de Janus megalithic structures of central Sardinia are considered to have been actual cities built by these demonic fairies during the Neolithic period. And my own field work in places such as megalithic Sardinia has made me come to see that there is indeed an undeniable link between what are known as the fairies of folklore and the demons of the religious world, and that both have more in common in terms of their effects upon and relationship towards the humans encounter both types of entity. If there's one thing we can say for certain about the belief in demons and demonology, it is beyond doubt a universal belief. There is not a single tribe or culture anywhere on earth that has not, at least in the past, given sizable cultural credence to the concept of such non-human intelligence, which is often malevolent to humanity and which exists within an invisible world just outside the five sense perceptions of human beings. However, when it suits these entities and when they are summoned by willing humans, the demons and similar entities can be transported over into our own reality to manifest before our very eyes either as terrifying monsters or invisible forces which generate chaos and malady within the environment they enter upon. In every culture, this act of demonic invocation, be it one of deliberate or unwelcomed intrusion, has been and is still taken very seriously and is an act to be approached with tremendous caution. The term demon itself is derived from the Greek diamonion or daemon. Although the ancient Greeks did not consider the idea of a demon to be exclusively malevolent to human interests, they were also believed to be associated with an unknown or exterior aspect of human consciousness, which later Carl Jung termed as shatonic, and is related to the gods and spirits of the underworld, of the earth, and is ultimately derived from the dark material side of the psyche. Jung himself openly described not only communicating with demons and these dark gods and goddesses the psyche made manifest within his alchemical tower, 
but also illustrated these entities he encountered within his legendary red book which was kept locked away until his death and which was to be denied publication for several more decades. Jung believed that the demons and other entities of religion and folklore had not vanished with the age of reason, rather they had been transformed into new entities and forms to reflect our contemporary experiences, beliefs and fears, from flying devils to flying saucers. However, although they were products of the human psyche, they could still manifest in physical form. Within the Indo-European tradition, demons were considered to be unclean spirits. This idea is almost certainly rooted in the ancient Babylonian belief, from which Judaism and Christianity have their primordial origins, and which associated demons as being dwellers of caves, underground pits, rubbish dumps, and old abandoned places. This may have made its way, in time, into the post-Christian folklore of the British Isles, which also believed that the fallen angels or defeated fairies resided inside Neolithic and Bronze Age passage mounds, and which, if the unsuspecting individual entered, would be energetically digested by the evil forces within the central chambers, as would a morsel of food be digested within the stomach of a man. Humans were considered very literally to be the soul food of the demonic world and people were to avoid such places as well as the dark and terrifying woodlands and other remote natural locations such as the caves and secluded regions. While on one hand these demons who dwelled in such places could have been considered compensatory archetypes for the very real dangers for humans within such places when say a bite from a wild animal or a fall upon a broken object could result with a deadly infection or a horrific ravaging of the flesh. It must also be noted that even today when ghost hunters and paranormal researchers attempt to gather evidence of demonic activity, they are more likely to find themselves looking inside an abandoned hospital or old castle rather than within a clean and modern environment. This Babylonian approach to the abodes of demonic entities persists to this very day. During the period of the European Renaissance, the approach towards demons by the educated classes changed to that of considering them to be useful tools within the practice of magic and witchcraft. Because demons are unbound to the space-time reality which humans exist within, these entities could be summoned and then ordered to reveal information about the future, lost treasure, and even be sent to attack an enemy. This concept of summoning four demons to employ their knowledge derived from a revival in Greek and Roman occult rituals which had found a new voice during the Renaissance when complemented with the practices derived from the alchemical tradition of the Middle Ages. The most famous case is that of Elizabethan magicians John Dee and Edward Kelly, who brought forth the entity which called itself Mandini while they were engaged in the search for the ultimate alchemical knowledge. This utilization of demons being invoked by magicians and occultists to be employed as weapons in something akin to spiritual warfare However, it is a form of combat which is considered extremely risky and can also lead to the annihilation of the very soul of the magician who dares to conjure up a demon for any purpose, especially that of spiritual warfare. In Hampstead, London, in the 1920s, a Theosophist group, which had a grievance with a nearby magic circle of occultists, took it upon themselves to summon forth a demonic entity to attack their esoteric rivals. When the magic circle got wind of the Theosophist plans, they conducted a ceremony to not only repel the demonic entity, but to also return it from whence it came. Which is what happened when the entity suddenly manifested at the Hampstead Theosophist meeting, unleashing mayhem, and which continued to cause chaos to the group and individual members until eventually it was returned to the abyss.
by the time of the Greek and Roman classical civilizations, a belief began to take root that both statues of gods and humans, due mainly to the advancement in realistic artistic renderings of the human form, were believed to be possessed by actual entities. Statues of, say, the god Apollo, Hecate, and so on. The gods and goddesses of the cosmos and the natural world were being culturally removed from the constellations and planets of the night sky, as well as from the beauty of the natural world to be then contained symbolically and literally within man-made objects. With the arrival of Christianity, and specifically following the sacking of the Library of Alexandria, along with the modern violation of Hypatia, the emergence of iconoclastic cults took root. These fanatics set about destroying pagan idols and effigies, and the results of these rampages of destruction gave rise to the notion that the energetic forces of the pagan god or goddess once contained within these artworks had been set free and was now abroad in the world as demons and other malevolent spirits. Even books and texts were considered to be unclean and filled with malevolent entities seeking every opportunity to destroy the spread of the gospel. The works of Plato, for example, were used as proof of such, as Plato himself once described Socrates as being demonically inspired, and this was taken by early Christians as proof of evil influences in the world in every aspect of the pagan religion which needed to be rooted out and banished. The initial war of locating and scattering the demons to the four winds is the origin of the rite of exorcism. It is also the reason why the Catholic Church goes to extreme lengths in order to avoid performing an exorcism, as the immortal nature of the demon means it cannot be ever destroyed, only set free into the world and the hunt begins again, thereby creating a self-perpetuating world of endless opportunities for the ambitious exorcist. The person possessed by the demons can be considered something of a portal between the demonic world and our own and on some levels the priest performing the exorcism is aware that he is transporting an interdimensional refugee into this reality in order to find fresh quarry. Once again we see this idea transferred into European folklore in that the destruction of pagan fairy forts and other ancient sites releasing the fairies who once resided inside them as vengeful spirits who will torment and seek revenge upon the violators and their descendants. While in the Celtic and wider pagan world, the cultural policy of leave well enough alone, or the very most, try to make amends with the angry spirit, was replaced in the Christian world as an eternal war between God's people and the feral demons unleashed by the iconoclasts. In many ways, the desire to utilize demons with the revival of witchcraft starting in the Renaissance had more in common with this appeasement and tolerance policy towards non-human entities as it existed in paganism. Eventually, with the Byzantine translation of the Hebrew texts into Greek, Christians would come to see even entire cities and communities as being repositories of these feral demons from the Cathars to Salem, to the satanic panics of the 1980s. Demonic infestation, akin to an invasion by an outside force upon the Christian world. Ding, ding, 
name, the Dweller in the Abyss, is Kuronzo, but he's not really an individual. The Abyss is empty of being. It is filled with all possible forms, each equally a name, each therefore evil in the true sense of the word. That is, meaningless but malignant, insofar as it craves to become real. These forms swirl sensely into haphazard heaps, like dust devils, and each just chance aggregation asserts itself to be an individual and shrieks. I am I. Though aware all the time that its elements have no truth, so that the slightest disturbance that dissipates the illusion, just as horsemen meeting the dust devil brings in the showers of the sands to the air. Among the volumes of demonology, there exists types of demons whose energetic and diamonic intensity is so powerful that such entities come close to attaining the status of gods, and whose power is so colossal and destructive that even the most daring and experienced magicians, and they most highly proficient in the art, will dare not even attempt to summon them from the abyss. Among these is the timeless, legendary and terrifying demon known as Koronzon, or Koronzon 333 the lord of cancer, chaos, and cholera. In the Thelema magical practice, he is the guardian of the tent Aether, which is called Zack, and he is the dweller in the abyss, who waits for the chance to leap into this reality and tear asunder the very souls of they who dare to invoke his name. The term abyss since the Middle Ages has been taken as being akin to some kind of hell, where all manner of horrors and depravity take place. The abyss is also the unseen realm of the demons, and also that of the jinn of the Middle East, the fairies of the Celtic world, elves of the Nordic mythology, and the Penagagalan of the East Asian tradition, and other non-material entities in all different cultures. Every folk and mythological tradition has their own name for these mysterious landscapes beyond the five sense reality, which we in the West have known as the abyss since the classical era. This bottomless non-reality where all the mysteries and fears of the world lay hidden below. Since the arrival of the Christian era, and in order to discourage notions of nature gods and polytheism, the meaning of the term abyss was changed to that of purely negative and evil connotations. However, this is not the original meaning of the term. In ancient times, the abyss was compared to being the inner reaches of the human mind where untapped powers are uncovered and used by those who are willing and perhaps foolhardy enough to go looking for them. In many ways, the journey into the abyss by a magician or a magi is comparable to that of a scientist working with the Hadron Collider looking for the God Particle by constantly going deeper and deeper into the subatomic and quantum field which underlines and begins at the cusp of chaos and order. This is why Kuranzon is known as the Lord of Chaos. The demon represents the last gateway leading from the material world into the chaos from which the universe is created. The invocation of Koronzon or Koronzon 333 represents the absolute expression of magic as being the unification of art and science in accordance with will. And this is a methodology comparable in every way to the work of scientists at locations such as CERN, unlocking the mysteries of the universe and attaining the status of a living God, but only if one can successfully get past the demonic guardians and tricksters of the abyss. Such ideas are universal. For instance, the hungry troll waiting under the bridge in the Scandinavian and Teutonic tradition, an archetypal danger in the guise of a non-human predator which guards the bridge between this world and other states of being. The World Wide Web itself was created by CERN and launched into the public domain on April 30th, 1993, which just happens to be Valpurgis Night, or the Witch's Sabbath as it is known in Central Europe. An intriguing date indeed for the launch of the most profound technological invention of the modern era, or perhaps of all time. 
It was also during this early phase of the World Wide Web that the Chaos Magicians were flourishing as a movement which sought to modernize magical ritual beyond what they saw were the outdated and overly academic approaches of Aleister Crowley's Thelema. One of the founders of Chaos Magic, Peter Carroll, created the ritual known as the Mass of Coronzon, based again on a scientific, in the magical sense, approach of launching one's ego into the abyss in order to achieve more synchronistic generated results of the process rather than achieving a specific objective aim as outlined at the start of the rite. No different than when a particle is launched into the CERN accelerator and the scientists wait to see what may or may not result from this. Coronzon's employment as the guardian of the tenth aether can be seen in metaphoric terms as the key to unlocking the full potential of human consciousness and thereby unleashing powers such as extrasensory perception and telekinesis and employing these abilities as on-demand functions when needed. This desire to enter into the unknown and Coronzon guarded reaches of the abyss alas comes with a great price be it the great financial cost of the CERN particle collider or the cost of the mind and soul of the magician. This price was clearly paid by Aleister Crowley's disciple and scribe, Victor Newberg, when the pair successfully brought Coronzon into full manifestation as a shape-shifting monster and seductress during a ritual they performed in the Sahara Desert in 1909. Coronzon was almost certainly the same demon who manipulated and fooled both Edward Kelly and John Dee back in the court of Queen Elizabeth, and which caused Kelly to refer to the demon Coronzon as the mightiest of devils. 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 In some cultures and certain supernatural traditions, demons are deliberately invoked into the body of a medium who has developed the ability often through witchcraft, to retain the demon for a limited period of time before expelling the demon once the information has been collected and coerced out of the entity. In the Afro-Latin American magical tradition of Santeria, ceremonies, which I have personally been present at, are based on the invocation of non-material beings in order to gain information about the future. The effect of observing firsthand one of these entities entering a Santeria practitioner is both terrifying and startling. The entity will speak in obscure African or Portuguese dialects and even the face of the person invoking the spirit occupying them will change. The demon will often demand large quantities of alcohol or marijuana, yet when the entity leaves the person's body, the Santeria practitioner is completely sober and alert as they were before the ritual began. The impression one is left with is that there are most certainly layers of awareness beyond the normal human consciousness level, and that among these other layers, all manner of other personalities, entities, and even demons can emerge. Anthropologists agree that nearly all cultures have believed in spirits, demons, and other entities which inhabit or affect human life. And the vast majority of societies have also recorded dramatic stories of demonic possession. Often, it is hard to make the distinction between what is a devil and what is a demon. And in the case of most demonic possessions, the demon will often refer to itself as the devil or Satan although there's almost no theological evidence to demonstrate that such an entity or being as the devil actually exists. In these cases, it's almost certain that the demon invokes the name of the devil in order to create something of an egotistical sense of importance to dominate and suppress individuals who are aware that they're dealing with demonic possession. Theologians interpret devils as fallen angels, the name Satan, for instance, means the enemy or the evil one. Lucifer, on the other hand, means the light bearer, and these are known as the kings of the devils or the kings of the demons. The devil and demons are often depicted as being hairy, 
having horns, having a long reptilian tail and universally cloven hooves. All of these symbolize the archetypes of wrongdoing and lying in terms of them denoting a fall from grace and the unconscious forces that influence our psyches and cause us to degrade ourselves and take part in moral wrongdoings and degenerate behavior. In theology, Satan is the enemy of spirituality or spiritual elevation. Symbolically, he represents the dark side of the Amphisena, the reptilian symbol of spiritual debt. In the Jewish tradition, demons were divided into ten hierarchies, the Sephiroth, each personifying a passion or a degrading behavior. The leader of the Sephiroth was Samael, the angel of toxic existence and debt. The Shatan, the Kabbalah, seduced the very first woman. His wife was Lilith, the mistress of debauchery and wickedness. She represented the nocturnal power in the Kabbalah, which regards these demons as blind forces of creation, being inferior to men. In more ancient theological approaches, these demons were divine emanations who lived within the blood of human beings, as this blood contained the principle of a vital heat. This is why Moses forbade the consumption of animal blood, believing that it contained demons, and these demons would then transfer themselves into the bloodlines of the Hebrews. Kabbalists also say that Satan's real name is Jehovah, spelt backwards. Carl Jung, on the other hand, claimed that demons are neuroses and complexes, that is to say, liable to provoke permanent disturbance in the psychic life of individuals. Demons are what makes people mistake the shadow for the substance. In recent times, something truly remarkable has begun to take place. Medical professionals are coming forward in increasing numbers and openly admitting a great risk to both their standing and their careers that in some small cases of undiagnosable mental illness demonic possession is real these medical professionals are not simply conveying mysterious behaviors in terms of metaphor but rather are specifically making the clear distinction that the individuals under their care in these rare cases are very literally under the control of a demon or a demonic force which has taken stewardship of their cognition and forced the personality of the demon to the fore, akin to something along the lines of an interdimensional entity occupying the body and mind of a human being and using it almost like a spacesuit to enter and take advantage of this reality. In New York, Richard Gallagher, who is a board certified psychiatrist and professor of clinical psychiatry at the New York Medical College, claims that he has personally encountered demonic possession and he is convinced that possession is much more widespread than anybody is willing to admit. His comments are indeed remarkable in that not only has he made them public but also major media outlets such as the Washington Post have covered his views on the matter. Gallagher who states he is a man of science and a lover of history studied at Princeton, Yale and Columbia universities and is of no doubt that demonic possession is very real and although not rare is still far more prevalent than he first assumed. In the late 1980s Gallagher was introduced to a self-styled satanic high priestess and she acknowledged worshipping Satan and that she was in fact his queen. A Catholic priest who introduced Gallagher to this woman stated that he had asked him to get involved in the case because he was a man of science. This introduction took place during the height of the so-called satanic panic of the 1980s and at first Gallagher, being a man of science and a lover of history, was inclined towards skepticism. However, as soon as he became involved in the case, he realized that the woman's behavior exceeded what could be explained with his professional training. The possessed woman could tell some people their secret weaknesses. She knew how individuals 
she had never known had died, including Gallagher's mother, by ovarian cancer. Such ability to know the unknowable has also been observed in schizophrenics. Gallagher then discovered that during her exorcism, witnesses heard the self-proclaimed satanic priestess speaking in multiple languages, including Latin, which is completely unfamiliar to her outside of trances. Eventually, Gallagher was to accept that this was not psychosis and concluded and agreed with the priest that this woman was indeed possessed. The Catholic priest who had asked for Gallagher's opinion of this bizarre case was the most experienced exorcist in the USA at the time, described him as an erudite and sensible man, and from this Gallagher developed a 25-year-long series of consultations in which he helped clergy from multiple denominations and faith to filter episodes of mental illness which represent the overwhelming majority of cases from actual demonic possession by entities. The evidence presented to Gallagher and his careful observation during his career has led him to believe in certain extremely uncommon cases can be explained no other way apart from the patient possessed by demons. Assaults upon the individuals are classified either as demonic possessions or as the slightly more common but less intense attacks usually called oppressions. A possessed individual may suddenly, in a type of trance, voice statements of astonishing venom and contempt for religion, while understanding and speaking various foreign languages previously unknown to them. The subject might also exhibit enormous physical strength and even in some cases the phenomena of actual levitation. He or she may demonstrate hidden knowledge of all sorts, like how a stranger's loved ones died, where treasure is buried, or what secrets and very personal facts some people who encountered a possessed individual have committed or taken part in. These are abilities that can only be explained by special psychic phenomena. In general, practitioners see psychotic patients all the time who claim to see or hear demons, histrionic or highly suggestible people, people often suffering from dissociative identity syndromes, and patients with personality disorders who are prone to misinterpret in what exorcists sometimes call pseudo-possession, a defense mechanism of externalizing projection. However, these cases and these traits are very, very different than some patients who may unexpectedly start speaking in perfect Latin or Old High German. One cannot force these entities to undergo lab studies or submit to scientific manipulation. And they also refuse in most cases to be recorded by video equipment. When they have been recorded with audio equipment, background noises and voices are very often heard. And in the days before digital recorders, mechanical tape recorders and cassette recorders were prone to breaking down their motor seizing up or else the tape being completely blank. Yet this is the evidence that skeptics often demand. The Catholic Church holds that demons are sentient and possess their own wills. They are also far craftier and far more devious than humans. So confusion and seed doubt. This is how they gaslight. A particular sensitive issue is that the Church does not wish to compromise a person's privacy who may be suffering from a demonic possession any more than doctors want to compromise a patient's confidentiality. People who dismiss these cases of demonic possession, according to Gallagher, unwittingly prevent patients from receiving the help they desperately require, either by failing to recommend them for psychiatric treatment or by not informing their spiritual ministers that something beyond a mental or other illness seems to be the issue. Gallagher is still a voice in the overall wilderness regarding the scientific approach, but there are also many people who still refuse to believe that evil itself exists. That is, until one morning they wake up 
kind of just staring them right in the face. One of the most interesting and legendary occurrences of demonic manifestation took place to Alistair Crowley when he brought forth the entity known as Awas. This event took place on April 8th, 9th and 10th, the year 1904, and Crowley claimed to be the incorporeal voice that dictated the Book of the Law. The entity itself, Awas, was compared by Crowley to that of the Fool card in the Tarot, in that it represented a kind of demonic innocence, the birth of possibilities, the beginning of a new aeon, as Crowley himself saw it. The entity itself bears a remarkable resemblance to what would later be known as the Grey Aliens or the Aliens of the Flying Saucer and UFO mythology. But as a view which ufologists and other investigators of this phenomena such as alien abduction have constantly mistaken these entities for aliens from other planets when in reality they are demonic manifestations brought into manifestation unwillingly and by individuals In David Conway's Magic and Occult Primer the author speaks of this sudden appearance of these demonic entities which often takes place as a great surprise, even to the magician who has no intention to summon an entity or a demon. Manifestations can sometimes take place. Even though magicians take care to set up ceremonial preliminaries designed to ensure that undesirable influences are kept out of the magic circle, eventually a time will come when the magician's experiments may well introduce him to what Conway calls as the delinquence of the astral dark those devils and demons so beloved of storytellers the world over. Their forms too are essentially forces, but a number of them do seem to have acquired a formal identity of their own, Conway tells us. To call them evil would be an oversimplification, but in this case life becomes easier if for once we allow ourselves to be oversimple. These demonic shapes are far from hideous, Conway tells us, at least to begin with when their owners may be striving to give a good impression. They appear as little children, gentle old folk, beautiful young people of both sexes. Though these entities themselves are not human, they will display as much resourcefulness as the most cunning human beings. They will often flatter, charm, threaten, or use their skills in an attempt to gain the upper hand over the magician. And the unwary or egotistical magician may well easily succumb to their wills. The question must be asked, what do these demons hope to achieve with this behavior? According to Conway, because demons are the forces of disorder and imbalance, they seek firstly to upset the ritual and then to thwart the magician's intention. For them, it's perceived as a threat which springs from the fact that the ritual success depends on the constituted aspects, positive and negative, of a perfectly balanced force. Such collaboration is abhorrent to any unbalanced force, and demons, for this reason, will attempt to cause havoc. Although physical assaults by demonic agents is comparatively rare, 
Conway does tell us that it is by no means unknown. However, Conway makes the point of stressing that a physical beating might be more preferable to a psychological assault imposed upon the victim by the demonic force. What he calls the science fiction monster will still be there, but the magician alone will be aware of it inside his mind causing torment, causing pain that will be so acute that his body will bear no scars. His own hell will be secretive, a private madness that no one else can share or even start to comprehend. When I myself was 17 years old, I came face to face with what I believe is a demon. I was lying in my bed one morning, turned around and noticed in the corner of my bedroom what looked like a small monkey staring around the room as if it was confused by its location. When it made eye contact with me, it screamed and jumped onto my back and began to violently beat me while also attempting to suffocate me by blocking the air passages in my mouth and nose with its hands. I could smell and taste the sweat on its fingers and I could feel the pounding. Over the years, people I've told this story to have mentioned everything from nightmares to sleep paralysis. But I was completely awake when this event happened. It was also early morning and there was plenty of daylight. It was not dark. More importantly, when I took a shower later that day, I had bruises on my back from where this entity had been violently pounding me. Much later on, I came across a picture in a book of the painting called The Nightmare by the Swiss artist Henry Fusley, which showed precisely the entity which attacked me that morning when I was 17. The attack also took place in the aftermath of an earthquake and the house that I was living in was located on top of a mass burial ground of plague victims from the Black Death. I do not believe that both these events are unrelated to the experience that I had. Even so, to this day I'm still not sure what demons are, whether my mind created it from the darkness of my own subconscious or whether in fact the earthquake that had happened had opened some kind of portal and an entity had come through. All I know is that what I saw that morning is exactly the same entity that Henry Fuseli painted. I also believe that many of the so-called great alien and other abduction events are part of the same demonic phenomena. After many years of personally looking into this subject, having first-hand experience and seeking answers in every place from magical texts to psychology and theology, I still can't say precisely what demons are. But one thing I do know for sure is that demons are real.